Okay. Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming to this public lecture and stargazing event uh, of Caltech Astronomy. My name is Rainer Jensen. I'm a postdoctoral fellow both here at Caltech and JPL. Before introducing tonight's program, uh, I would like to highlight some of the future events we're hosting uh, as part of the Caltech Astronomy Outreach Program, starting with a very special event. Uh, so grab a, a flyer on, the, on your way out for further details, but on November 11th, so Veterans Day, on the mor in, that's a Monday morning between 8 a.m. and 10 a.m., Mercury will transit in front of our sun. Uh, and in, if you want to view that, come and join us at the Beckman Lawn, which is the big piece of grass, more or less in the center of the campus, um, where we'll have a number of telescopes set up through which you can actually see the sun with the small dot of Mercury transiting in front of it. Um, so you won't be able to see this with your naked eye. And also, if you build your own provisional solar telescope, don't do this, because even with your eclipse glasses, you can very much hurt your eyes. Uh, simple eclipse glasses are not good for, enough for that. So come and join us Monday, November 11th, on the Beckman lawn between 8 and 10 in the morning. Uh, further details, keep her, your eyes out for our outreach webpage as well as our uh, social media. So the next public lecture event will be on December 6th. Uh, that we'll like th today we'll be starting at 7 and we'll have Katharine de Clear, assistant professor in planetary sciences, who will be talking about Jupiter's moon Io and its volcanic activity. Um, uh, furthermore, uh, we will have, as you know, you're not allowed to eat or drink inside, but if you prefer some beer with your astronomy, then once a month we're hosting Astronomy on Tap uh, at the Wolf. It's a bar in Old Pasadena, in downtown Old Pasadena. Uh, the next Astronomy on Tap will Monday, November 18th, and that will start at 7.30 in the evening. Uh, underage people are allowed to come, but they won't be allowed to drink alcohol, of course. <coughs> so with those three announcements out of the way, uh, I would like to introduce you to tonight's event. Um, We'll start by, with a lecture by Assistant Professor Jim Fuller, who will tell us about how we can look inside stars. Uh, after the lecture, we'll have time for, for questions from you uh, to Jim. Uh, he told me that if you have any pressing questions during the talk, don't hesitate to ask. Um, afterwards, uh, after the questions, we'll transform this into a Q&A panel where we have three Caltech graduate students, and you're happy to ask them anything about related to either astronomy or their life as an astronomer. Uh, in parallel, we'll have three telescopes set up uh, here in the back of the field. So you go out, take a right, and another right until you're on the sports field on the back of behind this building here. And uh, through these three telescopes, you'll be able to see Jupiter, Saturn, and the Moon. Um, and uh, if that basically also there, all the, all the volunteers there, don't hesitate to ask them any questions. Uh, if they can't answer it, please come back, ask the Q&A panel. If they can't answer it, just go back and forth until you have an answer. Uh, if that still, after two hours, so around nine, we'll wind down here. If that still doesn't have, hasn't satisfied your astrophysical curiosity, these lectures are all recorded, so you can to go to our astronomy Caltech Astronomy YouTube channel, where you can watch this lecture and all the previous lectures uh, given. So, minor note, as I already said, no food and drinks here in the auditorium. That also goes for no smoking. And all those three things, in addition to no high heels, all also are valid for the field outside. Um, so, with all the many announcements out of the way, I would like to announce the star of the show, Assistant Professor Dr. F Jim Fuller. Uh, Dr. Fuller did his PhD degree at Cornell University. Afterwards, he moved across the country to come here to California, where he did his, was a postdoctoral fellow both here at Caltech and at the Coffley Institute for Theoretical Physics in Santa Barbara. And since two years, he's here at Caltech as an assistant professor. And tonight, as you can see, he will be talking about the sound of stars, journey of the center of a star. 
Okay. Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Jim. I'm a professor of astronomy here at Caltech. And one of the things I study is astroseismology, which is basically the science of figuring out what is inside of stars, what lies at the very center of a star. Now, the famous uh, astrophysicist Sir Arthur Eddington once said that the center of a star is one of the most obscured places in the universe, and we'll never be able to see it directly. So tonight, we're going to learn why Sir Eddington was wrong. Uh, I'm going to take you on a journey to the center of a star. We are going to listen to some sweet, stellar beats, and <clears throat> uh, we're going to dabble in a little bit of theoretical astrophysics along the way. So, stars are not just static objects. They move, they evolve, and they pulsate. And those pulsations, if you looked at the surface of a star, might manifest as, say, temperature changes across the surface of a star. So if we could resolve the surface of a star, we might see a pattern like that. Now, those pulsations at the surface of the star are actually composed of waves that propagate all the way through the star. So if we could see the inside of the star, we might see a temperature pattern like that. Now, you can think of those pulsations of the star as waves, just like the sound waves you hear coming from my voice right now. And you can think of those pulsations as creating a sound. Now, of course, stars, well, space is a vacuum, and sound does not travel through space. So we can't see those sounds directly. But what we can do is measure the brightnesses of stars. In fact, stars are so far away, we can't even see the whole surface of the star. It just looks like a point source. But what we can do is just measure their brightness uh, as a function of time. So if we see a pulsating star, we might see its brightness move up and down like that. So this is basically a waveform. It's the same kind of waveform that we hear and that our ears and our brains are very good at interpreting. So we can think of the pulsations of stars as a song that each star plays. And that song, as we'll learn, tells us something about the size of the star, the structure of the star, and what lies at its very center. So to give you some intuition for how this works, I think we all know that objects that are small tend to vibrate fast, and that means they produce very high-pitched sounds. So here's a video of a little person playing a little violin. OK. So very adorable. This little violin, because it's not very long, it doesn't take uh, vibrations, so basically sound waves in the violin strings. It doesn't take them very long to move through the violin. That means the strings vibrate very fast and produce a high-pitched sound that we hear. Now, if you move to a much bigger instrument, it will take those strings much larger to, much longer to vibrate, and therefore it will produce a much lower-pitched sound just like this guy playing an octobass. This is about 10 times bigger, so the pitch it produces is something like 10 times lower. And it can be painfully slow, and just like the octobass, many stars are painfully slow in terms of the rate at which they oscillate. So it takes a really long time to hear their song. But if we're patient, uh, we can learn a lot. So let's compare <laughs> pop stars to actual stars. OK, pop stars uh, sing, of course, in the human hearing range, which is something like 100 or 1,000 hertz, 1,000 vibrations per second. Uh, now, the most gifted pop stars have a vocal range that spans maybe 100 to 3,000 hertz. That's about five octaves. So I think that's, that's what. Uh, the internet said about Mariah Carey's vocal range, who has one of the best ranges uh, in pop music. Now, that pales in comparison to actual stars that sing anywhere from 0 0.0000001 hertz to 1,000 hertz. So that's 10 to the minus 8 hertz. So that's an oscillation period of about 10 years. We have to watch a star for 10 years just to watch it pulsate a single time. Those are the biggest stars that produce those kinds of pulsations, like red supergiants. But the smallest stars, like neutron stars, actually sing at about 1,000 hertz, about the same pitch as Mariah Carey. Now, those stars 
of course, uh, will pulsate about 100 times in the blink of an eye. So you need a really good instrument be, to be able to see those pulsations. So it's challenging, uh, but we can do it. And what's even more fun is we can hear it. So I'm going to play you some sounds of some actual stars. Uh, these are uh, real, real star songs that we have made by basically taking observed pulsations of these kinds of stars and sonifying them. So to, to boost that into the hearing, human hearing range, uh, so most stars pulsate, I don't know, once every thousand seconds or so. To, so to boost it into the hearing, human hearing range, we have to speed it up by about a factor of a million. But if you do that, you'd hear something like this. This is about what the sun would sound like if you sonify its pulsations. So you can see there's a lot of different tones there. It's not just one pulsation. There's many different tones. If you look at a slightly bigger star than the sun, it would sound something like this. That's the middle star, yeah. So I think that's a, maybe a subgiant star. If you listen to a slightly bigger star, like a red giant star, you get similar sound, but at lower pitch. And typically, as you go to bigger stars, they start playing fewer and fewer notes, so their songs get a little simpler. So again, what we can measure is brightness as a function of time. If a star just pulsated one frequency, this would correspond to one note. So if I played you that song, it would just sound like a constant pitch, and that would be really boring. Uh, but luckily, stars have some timber. So just like a human voice or a musical instrument, stars actually play many different notes all at the same time. And that combination of notes has a very distinctive, recognizable sound to it. So for instance, if I measured the brightness of the star and it looked something like this, this would correspond to two different notes that the star was singing at the same time. So there'd be this lower pitch oscillation here, and there'd be this higher pitch oscillation that's producing these features here. So what we like to do in astronomy and physics is take measurements like this, say brightness as a function of time, and turn them into brightness as a function of frequency. So we want to know the specific notes or the specific frequencies at which stars are oscillating. So this star would basically play two notes, this low pitch note here and this high pitch note here. Now, real stars are kind of a mess. This is the light curve of a pulsating red giant star taken by the Kepler satellite. So you may have heard about the Kepler satellite. This is a really famous planet-finding mission that NASA sent into space. It's found thousands of planets. And, but the way it does that is it just measures the brightnesses of 100,000 stars at a time to extremely high accuracy. So that means, in addition to finding many planets that transit in front of the star, we also see many stars pulsating and singing for us at the same time. So we've been able to learn an enormous amount from data like this. So the way we do that is we measure the brightness of a star as a function of time. And again, we're going to take the Fourier transform, so we're going to look at the different notes the star would actually play. So if we do that for a star like that, we might see a series of notes like this. So each one of these peaks in this plot here is a different pulsation mode of a star. It's basically the star is dancing in a lot of different ways at the same time, uh, corresponding to different shapes, basically, the star is making. So this, uh, what these peaks labeled as zero are the whole star pulsating in and out like that. Uh, the, the peaks um, labeled by one are basically the surface of the star moving back and forth. And then you can get arbitrarily more complex ways in which the star pulsates. But you can think of those as each one of those as a different note that the star is singing at the same time. So this particular star is singing about 20 notes, I'd say, that we can detect uh, all at the same time. So this star would have a very distinctive sound. And that sound, like I said, tells us something about the deep interior of the star. Because these are musical notes uh, produced by waves that travel all the way through the star. So just like a wave traveling all the way through a musical instrument, uh, similar, it's a similar idea with stars. Now, like I said, I study astroseismology, which is based on Earth seismology. So the reason we know what's inside of the Earth is 
by looking at pulsations of the Earth. So when there's a big earthquake, say the San Andreas Fault shifts a bit, hopefully not in the near future, but if that happens, it will launch waves that travel through the Earth. In the Earth, there's two main kinds of waves. There's these P waves, these are pressure waves, which are the same thing as acoustic waves. Those are sound waves that you're hearing right now. And it's those same kind of acoustic waves that also propagate all the way through stars. Uh, so if we watched a P wave or an acoustic wave traveling through the Earth, it would go all the way through the Earth like that. And similarly, P waves traveling through stars like the Sun might take a path something like this. So some of them will go near the center of the Sun. Some of them get refracted out by the sound speed gradient inside of the sun, and so they'll trace out this very complex kind of spirograph pattern. So each pulsation of the star we see is actually produced by waves that take a path something like that. So if we observe a pulsation due to this wave, we get information about all of the star wherever that wave propagates. So in this part, in this diagram, it would be like the outer third of the star. So, what does that actually tell us? Well, again, coming back to this plot showing all the different notes that this sun-like star is producing, you see that there's a very recognizable pattern here. You see we have this double peak here, and then a single peak, and then a double peak here, and then a single peak. And that pattern repeats. So there's some spacing between these peaks, which is basically constant. And it turns out that spacing is determined by how long it takes a sound wave to travel all, all the way through the center of the star and back out. So if we measure that spacing, we know how long it takes a sound wave to propagate through the star. And it turns out that's directly related to the density of the star. So if we measure that, we can directly measure the density of a star. And remember, this is just a little point source of light that's you know, hundreds or thousands of light years away. We have no other way of measuring its mass or radius or density, but we can do it just by essentially listening to the, the song that it's playing. So this is a star like the sun. If we look at slightly larger stars, so red giant stars, their pulsation spectrum gets very complicated. So this is a, a power spectrum of, a, of that kind of star, and you see that there's hundreds of peaks in here. There's a lot of little, a lot of complex structure. Uh, and the reason is that this star has a different structure than the sun, so it plays different notes. And again, we can learn something from all this structure. This star essentially has a certain timber to it that we can recognize. So the reason that these red giants have different looking pulsation spectra, different sounding songs, is that the waves that travel through them actually have a mixed character. So they're sound waves at the surface of the star, but it turns out they they transition into a different kind of wave called a buoyancy wave. This kind of wave exists because the centers of stars are denser than their outer layers, and so there's a buoyancy force if you try to uh, perturb the fluid around. So that means that the pulsation spectrum of these stars actually gets quite complicated, but if we observe those pulsations, we can learn something about the very centers of those red giant stars, because we're seeing waves that have traveled all the way to the very core of the star and back out again. So as an example, if, again, if we look at this big mess of different musical notes that this star is producing, I want you to look at these peaks labeled L equal 1. You see that there's actually these kind of clusters of peaks. So first of all, all these L equal 1 peaks have three different components. They're triplets. We'll come back to that. But they also have uh, structures. So you see an L equal 1 group here, another group here, and another group here. If we measure that spacing between those groups, it turns out that that's directly related to the, what's happening in the cores of these stars. And that's really powerful, because if we look at these red giants, we don't actually know what's going on inside the centers of these stars. Many red giants look the same at the surface, but inside, something totally different is going on. So some red giants are burning hydrogen into helium, similar to the sun, except they're burning it in a thin shell. But some red giants are burning helium into carbon and oxygen in their centers. And we can't tell the difference from the surfaces of these stars. But if you measure this spacing between those groups of notes in the star, you see that there's two very clear, distinct different groups of stars. So these, all these stars here are called red giant branch stars. These are stars that are burning hydrogen in shells. And this cluster of stars here, these are all different stars 
that are, have a different you know, pattern, different sound of their voice. And that's because their core is different because they're burning helium into carbon instead of burning hydrogen. And so we have been able to actually specifically pinpoint exactly what a star is doing in its center, which we hadn't been able to do before. And this has also allowed us to test our models of stars to a precision uh, and in different techniques that we, than we've ever been able to use before. Uh, this kind of data we've never had before, and so we've never been able to test our models. And what we find is actually the models predict this structure pretty well. So we have a pretty good idea of what's going on inside these stars. We can do even, even cooler things. So I told you that all those groups of, uh, of modes, they're split into three different components. And that splitting occurs because stars also rotate. And if you have a pulsation that basically travels through the star in the same direction that the star is rotating, it gets boosted to a higher frequency. And so this is a pulsation that's traveling in the same direction as the star is rotating. This is a pulsation that's traveling in the opposite way. And this is a pulsation that's just sort of traveling up and down. And so by measuring the splitting, we can measure the rotation rate of the inside of the star, not just the surface of the star. And it turns out that stars, unlike the Earth, right? the Earth is a solid, so it all has to rotate at the same rate. Stars are fluid, so they can have the inner part of the star can rotate faster or slower than the outer part of the star. So we can actually measure that, too. It turns out that this pulsation, this group of pulsations, is produced by pulsations that are largely uh, confined to the interior of the star. And this group of pulsations is largely confined to the exterior of the star. And you see the splitting is larger for this group than it is for this group. And that means the center of the star is rotating faster than the surface of this star. So we can actually measure that for the first time ever. Um, and you know this is amazing, because we're just measuring the brightness of a star. That's all we're doing. But basically, we've learned how to interpret that sound uh, and learn all these interesting bits of physics about the cores of these stars. So that's been really fun. We can even do things like measure magnetic fields inside of stars. So this is something I've worked on. If you look at most stars, they play this nice series of, of notes that are sort of evenly spaced, and there's this very regular pattern. But some stars, which we called depressed stars, are these stars where some of those notes, the red ones, these red notes here, those are just missing. It's like if the star was a violin, somebody just, just cut some of the strings. And so when you play it, just some of the notes are missing. So that would obviously sound pretty bad if it was a violin, for stars, it means something weird is going on inside of those stars. And one of the things I've worked on is showing how magnetic fields deep inside of the star can actually produce this pattern. And that's something that I think nobody ever dreamt we could actually measure, certainly not Eddington. Um, so we've really been able to do some really amazing stuff just by listening to the sounds of stars. So stars are not always solo singers. I'd like to tell you a little bit about heartbeat stars, which are essentially stellar duets. Uh, and what these are, are binary stars uh, that orbit each other. So I'm going to play you a little movie of what these stars would look like. If you could see them orbiting each other, you'd see two pulsating stars on a very eccentric orbit. So they pass very close to each other. Uh, in this case, this is a system called KOI-54. It orbits each other every, 50, every 45 days. So when the stars pass very close to each other, their gravity, their mutual gravity distorts uh, the two stars. And so that changes the shape of the star, and that changes the brightness of the star. And so this is what we'd see if we actually measure the brightness of these stars. But the stars, they don't just relax back into spheres afterwards. Basically, they have to keep on pulsating, because it's sort of like they're a bell that they gets rung every time the stars pass through periastron here. And so the stars just keep on pulsating. Uh, so if you listen to the song of these stars, it would sound something like this. OK, so there's two things going on here. You hear a constant tone. That's basically this oscillation here. You also hear more of like a beat. And that beat is produced by this impulse that occurs every time the stars pass by each other at their closest approach. So there's many of these heartbeat stars. And they each have a different pattern to them. And that means they each produce a different song. So here's one that sounds actually quite similar. Again, you hear a tone and a beat. So by listening to these tones and beats, uh, you can actually figure out exactly 
how these stars are distorting each other, and you can understand how the orbits of these stars evolve. And that's another thing that I've worked on. Here's yet another one. This time it's a little hard to hear the beat. Turns out this time the stars pulsate exactly 229 times every orbit. Uh, and so the beat is a little, gets kind of lost in the tone there. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this time, you see the oscillations. There's only a few oscillations per orbit. And so this one doesn't sound quite as nice. Not something like that. So there it sounds more simple. It's more like one tone because you're basically just hearing this note and maybe a few, couple other notes. But it's a much simpler song. Yeah. Do I assign? So the question is, do I assign the same pitch to both stars? So basically, I'm treating the stars as one. I'm, I'm playing the sound of both stars at the same time. And actually, in this case, so this is two stars, but we don't always actually know which star is pulsating. We know that one of them is pulsating, but we don't necessarily know which is which. And you have to do a little more work to figure that out. Exactly. The interaction between the stars is causing them to oscillate. So essentially, it's like the stars are playing each other, two musical instruments playing one another. So in addition to stellar duets, there are trios and quartets. So uh, these quartets are not very common, but sometimes we get two of those heartbeat star systems that, in turn, orbit each other. So you have one heartbeat star here orbiting each other, you have another heartbeat star here orbiting each other, and then those two groups of stars all orbit each other. So it's a very intricate uh, melody that they're playing. And this is an example of one of those systems. So it's a little hard to see what's going on here, but you see this very regular pattern of peaks here. This is one of those binary stars playing its song. And then you see this other group of peaks that are spaced at larger frequency intervals. So that's a different binary star and all those stars are orbiting each other. Uh, so uh, I should start calling these barbershop quartet stars and see if that sticks in published journals. There's also uh, trios. So uh, I've worked on a star called the Trinity System. This is a system composed of two dwarf stars and one red giant star. The two dwarf stars orbit each other about once a day. And then they, in turn, orbit the red giant star roughly once every 45 days. And so if you actually watch the stars orbit each other, you'd see something like this. And so in this case, there's a very interesting effect that the motion of these stars actually distorts the gravitational field of this star enough that it, it forces this star to oscillate, because this star is feeling a changing gravitational field. And so it has to oscillate at the same rate that these two stars are orbiting each other. Uh, so that one, again, has a very unique sound, um, which I, I haven't sonified that one yet. But we can really learn a lot by seeing all these different kinds of systems. So the last thing I wanted to say before I end is that these kinds of effects are not just limited to stars. Uh, we can even see pulsations of planets. So Saturn is uh, one of the only planets where we've been able to detect its oscillations and hear its sound. And the reason we've been able to do it for Saturn is because it's uh, surrounded by these incredible rings. So Saturn has this beautiful, enormous ring system. And it turns out that we can't see the pulsations of Saturn directly. Uh, Saturn's surface is moving by about this far, once every several hours. And remember, it's not even really a surface. It's just like a, it's just a gaseous ball. So we can't actually see that motion directly. Saturn's uh, brightness maybe changes by one part per billion. And it's just too small of an effect for us to measure. But it turns out the rings act like a very sensitive microphone that can basically record and amplify the pulsations of Saturn. And so we can see structures in the rings. And we can tell that they're actually excited by oscillations of Saturn itself. And that means by observing the rings, we can basically play back Saturn's song. Uh, the rings are basically like a big record player for Saturn. And we can learn about the structure of Saturn by analyzing those pulsations. And that's something I've worked on. And we've learned that giant planets have quite different structures than, than many textbooks had depicted them. 
So there's really a lot of amazing things we can do. So as I end, I'm going to play you a cosmic symphony. Uh, so we're going to dim the lights. Just want you to sit back, relax, uh, and enjoy this amazing stellar orchestra. Okay, thank you everybody. Thank, thank you, Professor Fuller. Uh, he, Professor Fuller will now be taking questions. Please wait until I arrive at your place with this microphone so the audio recording will actually also hear you. First question was there in the back, I think. Thank you. Um, so if you're looking at variation of brightness, how do you distinguish between the star itself and say an exoplanet moving in front of the star or the equivalent of sunspots on the star? That's a great question. So the answer is we, we can't always do that. Exoplanets usually aren't so much of a problem because they're so small that their signals are just too small to be mistaken with the star which is dominating all the light output. So usually exoplanets aren't as much of a problem. Spots are more of a problem, or more of a, that basically they change the sound of a star, uh, because other stars like the sun have spots that go across and change the brightness of the star. And those aren't exactly pulsations, because um, they're not produced by waves that travel all the way through the star, but they do change the brightness. And usually you can distinguish because they're at different frequencies. So for instance, the sun pulsates roughly once every five minutes whereas the spots take about 30 days to move around the sun. So usually you can tell the difference because they're, they take different amounts of time to occur, but that's not always the case. So what sound would a pulsar or a neutron star make? So neutron stars are actually incredibly good uh, clocks in the sense that their pulsations are extremely stable. So we can use neutron stars to measure, to time things to with nanosecond precision. So you can use that for all sorts of purposes. So in that sense, they're sort of a very constant tone. But really, the, the pulse profile of a neutron star looks like this. It's a sharp peak and then another sharp peak. So actually, if you played that, it would be like a more of a beat sound. It'd be more like but da 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 It'd be, you know, uh, not, a nice, not a nice tone. So I didn't have any neutron stars in this talk. I'll add those. Uh, that's what I mean by a, a pulsar is a kind of neutron star. Yep. So, can you tell when a star is going to explode? Oh, <laughs> I wish. You know, it's funny you ask that. That's actually something I work on, and you actually potentially can. We haven't been able to do it yet, but I'm working on it. So it turns out that right before a star explodes. There's a lot of, there's some very violent fusion processes that are going on inside the center of the star, and that produces waves that go out to the surface of the star. And that would make the star pulsate in a very distinctive way, which we might be able to recognize and predict stars that are about to explode. We haven't been able to do it yet, because usually stars are in other galaxies, and it's really hard to see that. But I'm working on it. I'll let you know soon. I'm going to... I 
guess my question is more of why. What's the result of all this pulsing? I'm, I'm, I'm a diesel mechanic, so I understand mechanics. Yeah. And when a piston goes up, there's an explosion, there's a reaction. So I'm assuming, I assume that all these pulsing and all this power and this frequencies at different levels are reacting to and encouraging the rotation of the planet or the star and the orbit in which it functions, like the, uh, the binary stars going round and round. Does all that frequency kind of fuel or perpetuate the rotations and the orbits of these planets uh, and stars? Yeah, good question. So why they pulsate, that's very philosophical. I think a lot of it is just they pulsate a lot and they don't really accomplish much. But it's true that all those things are, interact, are interconnected. So for instance, uh, those binary stars that I showed, they excite pulsations in each other. And those pulsations transfer uh, energy and angular momentum between the stars. And so that does change their orbits and it changes the rates at which they spin. Uh, so certainly that happens and we can... We don't understand exactly how that process works, but we can measure their pulsations and test our theories because basically the way the pulsations look like will depend on, say, the spin rate of the star or the rate at which that energy, uh, the rate at which the orbit is changing its shape. And so we can test all those theories and understand exactly how that dance, how that dance uh, progresses. I have two questions. Um, can a star and a planet interact? Great question. So people have been looking for that. The answer is definitely yes. So for instance, uh, a planet orbiting really close to a star will cause the star to be distorted a little bit. And likewise, the planet will get distorted by the gravity of the star. So. Uh, in most cases, we're just still working on trying to find the planets, but there are maybe a couple cases where we've seen that effect already. And so, my yeah. second question you already answered with your answer. Oh, was, <laughs> all right. Uh, so I have a question about CFID variables. Um, huh? What does their wave pattern look like? What do they sound like? Like when they're in the bright phase, are they like changing keys or singing louder or, or what? Yeah, so Cepheids, the question is what are Cepheids? Cepheid is a famous class of pulsating star that we actually can use to measure distances because it turns out the rate at which they pulsate, so in other words, the Sorry to interrupt, but how are you pronouncing it? Cepheids. Cepheids. I've heard Kephids, I've heard Cephids. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Any rate, yeah, go ahead. So Cepheids pulsate, and we can see those pulsations even in stars and other galaxies. And what we've learned is that the rate at which they pulsate tells us how, how bright the star is. And so if we see it, we can actually measure uh, the distances to other galaxies that way. So Cepheids, are, Cepheids, for the most part, are very stable pulsators, and their pulsation is almost like a sine wave. So I think they'd, I don't have any of their sounds, but I think it would be pretty boring. It would probably be about one or two notes that would just be overtones. So it would be like, uh, like say, an A, and then an A and one key higher, and that's about it. So, Thank you. Yep. I see three, four. Let's make that four last questions. One, two, three, four. OK. Yeah, uh, I w we went to Huntington Library, and in the orbit, it so has something similar to that, uh, what you've just played. Is it, uh, it is related, the orbit? The, 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 the orbit, they also play something like the, the satellite heard from the, hmm. in the universe. I don't know. It sounds like they're stealing my sick beats. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get my lawyers on that one. Oh I, I actually, I'm they have a big structure and play the music. It's so similar somehow. OK. Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> OK. OK, so if you can use uh, Saturn's rings to see uh, the waves off Saturn, is it possible to use nebulas to read the waves from stars within it? Great question. It's a really great audience. So we've done that too, actually. I haven't done that, but other people have done that, I think, with Cepheids, 
what they can see is a light echo. So a Cepheid pulsates, and so that means the amount of light it emits changes. And so we can also see light reflected off the nebula around the star. And so certain parts of the uh, nebula will be illuminated more or less strongly depending on how long, uh, basically, the light travel time between that part of the nebula and the star. And so we can see this pattern in the light echoes that's determined by the rate at which the star is pulsating. So uh, yeah, we have seen that in at least a couple of cases. It's really cool. Um, but in, for the most part, stars are so distant, so far away, they don't, it's hard to see those kinds of effects. We can only see it in rare circumstances. Um, I come from an audiology background, so I'm really interested in how you guys equate um, why the pulsating of brightness is equated to sound, or is this being measured as brightness as a function of frequency? So what we're measuring is brightness as a function of time. Uh, and then what you can do is just turn that into a sound bite. So basically, all I did to make these sound bites was I took some of those measurements of brightness as a function of time, and uh, I put them into a little Python code that basically turns any waveform into sound. So I had to boost them by about a factor of a million, uh, so a million times higher frequency. But then it just translates directly to a sound wave. So that's how I did it. I think that's really, really cool. Um, first off, like, well done. Um, but then I did have a question about um, if different processes are occurring within the Earth, within a core, um, how can you be certain that other, if you've already noticed that missing notes occur through magnetic fields, how can you be certain that other processes are occurring within the core that were unable to be measured? Uh, so I suppose we can't always be certain. Um, there could be other processes that are occurring that we are not seeing directly. And that's where we have to try to do some work with making predictions based on you know, physics and testing those predictions with the data. Um, and so you have to you know, constantly go back and forth making predictions and testing them. Uh, but there could always be something going on that you know, we can't see directly that we haven't predicted. And then it's hard to know if it's happening or not. But for the most part, most of our theories have stacked up. And there's just a few new things that we've learned uh, based on those kinds of data. Uh, the, uh, the binary systems and the three and four star systems you said you couldn't tell which star it was coming from, the signal, so you can't really distinguish that it's optically that it's a binary system. You determine it from the sound or from the Yeah, so most of those systems frequency. were identified as binaries. We didn't know they were binaries before, but then we saw their, or we listened to their sound. And that's how you knew. And then we can identify them. Now, we can go back and check that, too. So that's one of the things I've done. You can also measure the motion of these stars using a technique called radial velocity to confirm that they are indeed binary star systems. Okay. Although I did get fooled once or twice. There's a couple just weird pulsating stars that I thought were binaries that were actually just one pulsating star. Oh, all right. so that can happen too. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay. Let's thank Professor Fuller again. Okay, uh, hello everyone, especially all the people who remained here for our Q&A panel. So we have three amazing grad students and postdocs here who are willing to answer any question regarding tangentially, even tangentially related to astrophysics and their lives as astronomers. So I have them introduce themselves and afterwards we go to your questions. Again, please wait until I'm there with a the microphone so the audio recording uh, doesn't ha isn't hampered too much. Hi, I'm Samantha. I'm a first year grad student here. Oh, I work on, well, I actually work with Jim, the professor that just gave a talk on stars and stellar evolution. Uh, hello, I'm uh, Evan. I am also a first year grad student here. I'm working on um, galaxy evolution, basically. Yeah. Hello, I'm Luis. I'm a postdoc uh, in between JPL and here at Caltech. And I work a little bit in between astrophysics and cosmology. So that means galaxies, but when a group of galaxies do weird things and how they evolve and along the history of the universe. That's my work. Uh, hello. Um, yeah, thanks for uh, coming. And um, I was wondering, um, in general, 
what kind of drives uh, um, the decision to go for like one thing in research or uh, maybe say it a little bit better uh, what are the like kind of like interesting research subjects that eventually people decide to work on or uh, they eventually get funding for just that kind of uh, concept in general thanks Um, well, I don't know too much about generally, but I guess personally, um, when I was choosing what I wanted to study, it had a lot to do with like just what aspects of the actual work were interesting, first of all, like what I was going to do day to day. Like personally, I enjoyed math a lot, so I wanted to do something more theoretical where I was more thinking about how things work in an equation way. And some people, like Evan here, like to look at the thing. <laughs> instead of just playing with it on a computer. So that is also interesting to some people. But then as far as the topic, at first I was like super broadly interested in many things. But I think as you start working on different topics, you get a better feel for what kind of goes into it and what the cool questions are. And people kind of diverge from there. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, for me, I, I'm an amateur astronomer, so I love to go out with my own telescope. I have three. One of them I made myself, and I love to go and look at these objects that just are in the universe. And being able to do research on these objects, as you can imagine, feels very personal because I've seen the raw photons that are emitting from these sources with my own pupil, like with my own eyes. So like being able to do quantitative analysis on these objects just means the world to me. Uh, with that being said, that only narrows my interest to the observational world, for instance. And you can do so many things in that broad category. So for me, what ended up happening was whatever project was available at the time, that's kind of what I took. So I've worked on three, well, really at this point now, four completely different projects, going from looking at the stellar structure of stars to high redshift quasars, which is cosmology, right? Um, but they all have the same underlying theme that we're observing these objects, and with this data, we're trying to extrapolate what the deeper physics of all these objects is, um, or excuse me, the, the physics that describe how these objects are um, uh, uh, emitting effectively. Um, and, I, and kind of after that, it's really, I guess, up to you to convince, like a grant panel, for instance, or whatever, whether or not the research should get funded. Like that's kind of. I mean, if, if you talk to the right person, they can make a rock sound incredibly interesting, right? Whereas for another person, they can take the most interesting topic and make it sound like, oh, I just want to fall asleep, you know? So, yeah, hopefully that's a satisfying uh, answer there. Um, I think maybe um, a comparison would be like, um, if you like astronomy, the, the usual problem, I think, is that Everything is super cool, so you want to do everything. Um, and it's kind of OK, but what happens is every, uh, every topic that you decide requires you to go very deep. And it's some, somehow a problem because you are supposed to be really expert on something. And if you want to be expert on something, you go to the fine details. And then if you like something else and you want to jump to another thing, then it takes you a lot of time to do that. So, but. It's possible. In my case, I, I do theory, so I do equations. I don't, I don't own a telescope, for instance. Um, so for me, it's like, oh, this is interesting. I can read something, and I can write uh, uh, some equations. If the equations make sense, then I continue on that topic. Uh, but if don't make sense, which is common as well, then you jump to another thing. So I think it's a bit like you jump into the astronomy river or the cosmology river, and then you can swim a bit on the sides, but you're always going with the, with the flow as well. So um, yeah, you are driven a little bit among diff different things. Uh, I see you do black hole research, and you say you do theor theory, so I'd like to know about what you work on in that regard. Um, I, um, it's not exactly the black hole. It's everything that happens around the black hole. In more detail, um, I have been recently studying the gas that is falling into the black hole just before falling in and disappearing forever. What happens to that gas? So that gas is kind of 
when you flush the toilet at home and there is this water going around, that's exactly what happens around a black hole as well. All this material is orbiting the black hole and getting closer, closer, and closer. And this material, as it gets closer, it gets compressed. And this compression increases the temperature of this gas, and this gas gets uh, at some point so hot that emits radiation. It's like when you heat iron or something that gets red. Um, so what I've been studying is like how this material orbiting the black hole before, before falling in is heated and compressed, and at some point it's even ejected, and then it can escape the black hole. That's my thing in there. What happens from there inside? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thanks. Any further questions? You have uh, galaxy formation as one of your areas as well, so I'm just curious if you have a particular um, inclination towards, is there something that you tend to find more credible uh, as far as what dark matter consists of? Because I know there are a lot of theories about what exactly, what exactly what kind of particles it may be. Is there anything that you find particularly compelling? No. <laughs> Um, no, I'm not um, very involved in the dark matter part of, uh, of the galaxies. For me, the dark matter is the basic structure where the galaxies then they are formed on top of that basic structure. And I don't pay much attention whether dark matter is a bit colder or warmer or something so that the structure is a bit more diffuse or a bit more clumpy. Um, that I kind of avoid a little bit. Um, yeah, and I think that's my answer. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. There are different theories for dark matter. They are uh, trying to. Every theory predicts some things, and then the job is like, okay, this prediction can we check? Can we observe that thing? Um, and that's the status. But actually, there are many different theories, but they have a very small range or differences between them, so it's difficult to to check. But yeah, that's a big thing. Lots of people are working on this. Correct, <laughs> yes. Um, is, it just be is it because it's, it's too complicated or too hard to think about what is going on in terms of the dark matter, or, just, or is it just that the second part, the actual, the visible matter is more interesting to you? The second, the second part, yes, exactly. For me, you make a hole and then you throw water. Some of the water will fall into that hole. I care about the water. As long as there is a hole, it's fine. Correct. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I'm just more interested in uh, once you form a galaxy on top of that scaffolding, how the galaxy will behave, how the stars will be born, how much radiation they will emit. Will we be, will we be able to detect that radiation? Is the galaxy older, younger? But the underlying structure, yeah, it's not very relevant for me. Cool. So this one's for Evan on the pre-main sequence stellar evolution. Like, so how did you choose that and like, why, you know, why do you care about it? Fair enough. Uh, so the, I actually didn't choose the project. It was kind of gifted to me, I suppose. Uh, so I did my uh, undergrad over at Cal Poly Pomona, and one professor there uh, works in pre-main sequence stellar evolution. Um, I had a choice to research with him or another faculty advisor, and this project seemed just way more interesting to me. Uh, so that's personally why I ended up picking with it. Uh, um, it kind of fit my criteria of what I was looking for, which was an observational project. So the, for, for our approach to what this is, so pre-made sequence stellar evolution. So most stars like the sun are on the main sequence. This is where they're burning, we're, we're really fusing hydrogen into helium uh, in their cores. Now our classical picture of how stars form is that you have some big cloud of gas and dust, we call them GMCs, giant molecular clouds, they'll collapse and at some point, the, 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 the collapsed cores will get dense enough and hot enough that they'll turn into a star. Now, that's a, I, mind you, I literally just skipped through like millions of years of evolution, at least for some of the stars, right, for some of the masses. There are a lot of parts of that process that we just don't know. Well, we have zeroth order approximations for all of it, but if we want any finer detail, which is what we were trying to do, then we need to look uh, more deeply. So 
after you get past the phase when the star is a protostar where it's still trying to gain its mass, uh, it reaches a point where it's all along the pre-main sequence. This is where it is fully, it has all of its mass, but it's still not hot enough to fuse hydrogen into helium. That's where, I, that's where I come in. I want to study, we wanted to study these stars. Now, the reason that we cared about them is because if you look at a very particular type of pre-main sequence star, they're called intermediate mass pre-main sequence stars. Uh, these are uh, st uh, stars between two and eight solar masses that, again, aren't fusing hydrogen to helium yet. They can emit detectable x-rays, but for a very short amount of time. Now, if you can characterize how long they should be emitting x-rays, and, and, and if you find these sources emitting x-rays, you can say, oh, well, this region should be no older than blank years, right? And so for us, we are studying them because we want to use them for age dating analysis. It's very difficult to age anything in the universe because for our short lifetimes, we're just basically looking at one single frame out of a giant, out of a giant universe movie. And if we want to find anything that, uh, any, any idea of, what an, of the age of anything, we have to extrapolate, basically, look at different populations and stuff. Um, and so that is why I'm interested in it, because it, it'll help us age different regions in the universe, because it's just so difficult. So, yeah. So, I have a question, Dr. Lewis, since you're studying black holes. Uh, so, it's basically a two-part question. First of all, is what portion of your studying black holes is revolved around studying quantum liquids? And of that, like, how, in, how do you relate it to studying black holes in general? You know, it might Sorry. be... Sorry, can you repeat that? So it's like what portion of you studying black holes is uh, uh, like studying quantum liquids and like connecting it to studying black holes? So yeah, it's so, uh, what portion of it? What portion of me studying black holes is related to quantum liquids? Yes. Zero percent. Um, quantum liquids, maybe it's the first time I hear this term, um, somewhat. Um, so so uh, yeah. I don't work on quantum liquids at all. Uh, I don't use quantum mechanics to work on the part of black holes that I'm interested in because general relativity and quantum mechanics kicks in when you're really close to the black hole and weird things happen. Um, so I try to avoid that weirdness and I'm staying far uh, away enough from the, the, the center of the black hole to just consider normal physics. So basically, for me, it's, la it's uh, thermodynamics. It's like the gas falling into, gets heated, gets compressed, or so pressure temperatures, uh, gas ejected, jets. But I don't go where at that time or at that place where the time sta uh, starts going slower and slower, and then you get older more slowly and slowly. I don't go into that direction. So I keep it classical, classical mechanics regime in technical words. I had a question for Samantha and Evan. Since you said you were first year grad students, are you in a PhD program? And if you are, what's your ideal job when you get that PhD? Good question. Yeah, yes, yes. So both Sam and I are in the uh, PhD program here uh, for the astrophysics option. Uh, I'm going the observational route, Sam is going the theory route, good old theorist. Uh, and um, I think my idea, well, my future goal, like my career goal, is to be a research professor somewhere. Um, I have no idea where it's going to be. Uh, it would be nice to have it in SoCal. I've literally been here my entire life, uh, so that'd be nice. Family, like if you were, if you were to pick any cardinal direction and go an hour in that direction, you'll, you'll find one of my family members. So it's really nice to, to be in SoCal, and I would like to stay here. Um, but I would also like to infuse uh, teaching into my career. So I have benefited from amazing mentoring. As a matter of fact, I really do think that that's a big part of, like, of why I'm here in the first place. Um, of course, I had to put in a bunch of work to get to this point. That's always the case. But having a person to really you know, kick you on your butt sometimes and be like, hey, go do better or do more, that really means a lot. Um, so for me, that's probably what I would want to do as a research professor. If that doesn't work, then a uh, staff scientist somewhere, maybe at um, you know, maybe Max Planck Institute or... JPL or um, Carnegie Observatories, for instance. So long as I can conti continue doing science, then I think I'll, I'll be pretty happy with that. Yeah, so like Evan said, I'm also in the PhD program. Um, and I think, I, I guess the ideal job would be to be a professor, but I think my main criteria is, like Evan said, just to be teaching. I used, a lot of the reason I applied to do a PhD program was because 
I had been teaching in my undergrad. I went to UC Berkeley up north, and I used to teach math to like other college students like the whole time that I was an undergrad. And doing that was what inspired me to want to go into the PhD program. I had already been interested in doing research, and then the reason I decided to take it so far as to do a PhD was that I knew that that was one of the ways that you could become a professor, I guess, like which is a job that's pretty great where you get to teach and get to do cool science in the background. But if I didn't become like a professor specifically, I'd probably still go into a job that involved teaching in some way. Maybe I could, well, I mean, I think I could always teach math at a community college, you know, stuff like that. And, or I would, if I wanted to stay tangentially related to astronomy in some way, probably a position of outreach or maybe as Evan said, staff scientist, but hopefully with some like communications aspects so that I could keep being in an educating role. I also did want to add, to add to my answer as well. So I actually um, was a community college student. I went to uh, El Camino College, if anybody knows where that is, in Torrance, California, about 45 minutes down the 110. Um, yes, it's yes. Um, and so I have a very uh, deep and personal connection, if you can imagine, to students that are in the community college world. There is a very big stigma against community college students, right? We're failed, uh, you know, we're has been, you know, they're not worth the time, whatever. And so it means so much for me to, to be sitting here and telling this to everyone that, no, we're normal students and we can compete and w you can waste your time anywhere. So if you make the best of what you got, then you can end up where you want to be. Uh, so with all that being said, um, I would also like to teach um, at, at, at a community college. Specifically, if I could, I would love to teach back at Elko. I feel like that'd be just the best full circle that I could ever think of, you know? So... I've been at College of the Canyons the last 30 years, and we have a fantastic astronomy program, and it's really nice for me to be able to say that, well, I met a community college student who went on and who, you know, to Cal Poly and is working on his PhD at Caltech, so thank you. Thank you. Let me then quickly add that, again, also for this outreach event, we are getting regular help from community college students from the Pasadena City College. So among two of our telescope volunteers are from there. So go and say hi for them, uh, to them if you want. Uh, I think there was the first question. Uh, first of all, Evan, I attended El Camino. Uh, it's an awesome community college. And uh, I fully agree with you. Community colleges are underrated and that stigma needs to go. Uh, anyway, uh, I think this question is uh, for Samantha. Um, okay, well, it's got to be in two parts, because I've got to make sure that I understand something correctly. It, if I remember correctly, most uh, star systems are multi. That is, they're binaries or trinaries. And, am, I, am I correct? Yes, there is a majority of stars that are in okay. binaries, at least. Yeah. Okay. Um, so my question is, why is that? Or if it would be easier to answer, why is our sun the exception? Do you understand what I'm getting at? Yeah. I okay. See. I don't know if I know the reason why there are more binaries because our understanding to this point has reached like, oh, there are a lot. We've messed up how we <laughs> decided to think about stars because we've all learned like single star evolution up to this point. Because we looked at our sun and we were like, this one is by itself, so most of the other ones must be. But it has something to do with where you. This is not like the 100% answer because I don't know for sure, but it does have something to do with like the just the surround the environment that you're star was born in, because as Evan was saying, this goes, astronomy is like totally connected. If you were that pre-main sequence cloud and you collapsed and you became a star, but right next to you, very close to you in that cloud, another star came, then those two stars are like close enough to be gravitationally bound, and that would be one way that binaries could form just from being born. But then you could be in a cloud where just all of that, there was only one little 
density fluctuation for all of your gas to come in and you were just that star by yourself and your cloud didn't make anyone near you and then you would be like the sun for example there's also possibilities that you were your, your star is in the binary but at some point one of the stars in the binary gets like kicked away so that we end up seeing only one of them at the time or in there's such a wide binary that you see one and there's actually another one that's technically gravitational interact gravitationally interacting but it's just like really far away and we didn't connect it with them so that isn't a very satisfying answer because I feel like we actually don't know exactly why some stars are single and some are not but those are like different scenarios that could happen to cause it to happen at least when I when I hear a scientist say we don't know I know I'm dealing with an honest person so yeah. <laughs> Um, are, are there any like regions of the galaxy where single stars might, like our sun, might be more populous? Uh, I should ask one of the galaxy people this. <laughs> what do you think? Are, are there are there any regions of the galaxy where uh, single star systems like our sun uh, are more abundant? And thank you. Um, I'm not sure about that, um, but uh, but I think but I think Samantha's answer is uh, is also answering this question. So so the thing, if I if I got this right in my undergrad or something, um, so there are characteristic scales or characteristic size from where you can. Um, uh, accrete your material, gravity will be able to accrete that material, form a cloud of gas of, the, of a given size. If it's if you have a chunk of gas that is above that size, then usually that will disrupt and will break. So uh, when the universe evolves, you end up with a kind of average cloud size. And then this average cloud size will give you an average number of stars that you can more or less form within that cloud which goes exactly in the same direction as Samantha was saying. So I think there is an um, average size of clouds, and then that means you can form two or three stars per cloud of that, of that given size. And that's why we have um, uh, two, th two systems, three object systems, sometimes one, plus the, all the dynamics and if one is kicked out or something. Um, but also these clouds, of course, are affected by whether they are happening or they exist close to a radiation source. So if there is a cloud that forms the stars very quickly, these stars will emit a lot of radiation. And if there is another cloud next to it that would like to form stars, the radiation of the first cloud may just uh, make this one go away or dissipate. So you will not form clouds there. So all this explanation is just to say that yes, there are different regions where the interaction between clouds and stars and radiation will uh, make voids of gas and other regions that will be overdense of gas. So in these overdense regions of gas, you will have an overdensity of stars and possibly you will have an overdensity of uh, multiple systems. And where you have voids, maybe you will have smaller cloudlets and then you will end up with more single stars. Uh, Broadly speaking, that's not super technical answer, but but in that direction. So, this is just speculation because I don't do this professionally or ever studied it. But the, as I understand it, Jupiter. The the thing that keeps Jupiter from having become a star is it's just not quite massive enough for like fusion to happen. But, you know, but like something like ninety five percent of the disk of material that what didn't go into the sun went into Jupiter. So is it is it possible that in our own system, like it, it simply what kept it from being a binary star system was that Jupiter just didn't get big enough to become a star, but it easily could have if some of the material that went into forming other planets or other stuff in the solar system had coalesced into Jupiter. And then I guess the que a, a question related to that would be, do we, do we see binary star systems where there are stars located that close together or closer than that as far as the distance from the sun and Jupiter, between the sun and Jupiter? I can answer the part about whether they're close. Um, you can have really close binaries, but it is hard to get them to be that close just like like they just appeared that close together when they were born. A lot of the ways that we see 
binaries being that close is that they first started out pretty far apart. So the reason they wouldn't be that close generally for stars is because there would be so much, if they were as close as Jupiter and the sun, they would interact like so much that I think dynamic, we wouldn't see it like as one star probably, we wouldn't be able to see the binary probably if it was that close just like from Earth seeing it and also it would interact like a lot and it would be pretty unstable. But we can get them that close sometimes, you know, we've, we have mergers of stars, the neutron star merger, black hole mergers we've learned. And usually when that happens is first they're like pretty far apart, but as you were saying, there's like disks of material or, or they can form disks of material around them and if they're both in the same disk of material, they can kind of like, there's like friction between the star and the material and that lets them come closer and closer because they're in that disk of material getting, losing energy as they push against the gas around them. And that can get them really close and that's the, a very, not super well understood <laughs> channel of forming close binaries, but the main idea behind it. Um, so they could be that close, but you know. I know I had uh, the question about Jupiter as well, but I, just to what you said, um, you were saying how it would be difficult to observe two stars that were as close together as, say, the Sun and Jupiter at a distance, but, uh, you know, they found exoplanets that are much, much closer, and I know they're not necessarily directly observed, um, but I would imagine that some of the techniques that they use, you could also identify that what looks like one star at a great distance is actually multiple stars, right? Improved uh, exoplanet detection techniques recently, and they could definitely apply it to that. I don't have a good idea myself of what the minimum distance they're able to observe is. You know, at all? We need an exoplanet person <laughs> to tell us. But well, yeah. I mean, the the Kepler B system, right? That aren't like all seven planets they found are like within the distance between the Sun and Earth. I mean, it's some it, they're really, really close to the star, so way way closer than Jupiter. I'm just going to assert that as a fact and <laughs> prove me wrong. I, I think we can definitely, with radial velocity, discriminate two stars which are as close to, let's say, a G well, we can, we can at least observe there's two stars rotating around each other at the Jupiter orbit uh, because we can see, well, uh, exoplanets more or less at that planet or at that radius if they're heavy enough or, or closer by. But as, as Samantha also said, these things will interact so heavily with each other that there will be a, a lot of extra effects going on between these two stars. I think we have a first question. So I think this question is actually for you. Um, so, uh, I see you have under there uh, instrumentation. So, I'm in community college right now um, doing uh, mechanical engineering. So, how does instrumentation play into what you do with astronomy? And is there anything that, you know, like a future mechanical engineer can do with building instruments or designing instruments? Mechanical engineers, yes, we need them. Um, we have these things called telescopes. And they're about uh, 10 meters primary dishes, which means they're, and we're going to 30 meter primary or primary dishes. So there's these massive st structures, and that alone al already needs mechanical engineers to design so that we have a 30 meter dish which works and not a 30 meter dish which has collapsed onto the ground. Um, so instrumentation, so I'm working on a much smaller scale uh, in terms of instruments, so I'm working on basically the, the photographic, the photo camera behind the telescope and then within the photo camera I'm working on the, sig let's say, the CCD chip to actually receive the light and turn it into electrical signals which we can study on the computer. But in order for that thing to work, we need the structure around it, we need the camera mounts, we need, oh, as I said, all the way from there out to the full telescope. So there's definitely work for uh, mechanical engineers and there's mechanical engineers here. If you would walk thrown down the corridor, you would see offices of our mechanical engineers here. Uh, JPL has a lot of mechanical engineers for all the missions they're running. So yeah, we need mechanical engineers. 
I just want to add something to that. Um, so I uh, I thought that was very cool because I do I do theory. So basically, I just write some equations in basically means bad handwriting, and then uh, inventing things. But actually, these last few years, and especially coming here, California Institute of Technology, and uh, also at JPL, which I see you have the the T-shirt, I have discovered that theorists, I mean, do well. But the real heroes of this business are people doing instruments. Because I can write whatever, I can propose ideas or different solutions for many problems. But to get there, then we need people who really care about using cadmium, cadmium or manganesium for that chip. Because one will make the detection and the other not or something. I'm not even sure what I'm saying, but it's, it's that important. So, so yeah, definitely you're on the good track. Very good one, yes. In terms of the computational work, um, since you're doing, working on extremely large scales, how big is one cell in your computational code? Yeah, it's pretty big. Um, <laughs> well, I've run, so if I'm talking about one of my like three-dimensional simulations, so I've done simulations of binary stars that merge. Um, so in that case, the cell with is like we well actually we're, we're supposed to be proud that the cell width is like small because that means we can see very small but the smallest one would probably still be like a hundredth of the width of the sun or of the radius of the sun and then the biggest one is like hundreds of radii of the sun on that order um, but we usually because we, it's a kind of expensive to you like keep everything really small. We make the small ones near where stuff is happening, and right, the big right. ones far away from where stuff isn't happening. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Sorry. Also, just to add to here, she said that it's not very good resolution because it's a hundredth of the size of the sun. But when you do cosmology and simulations, when you want to simulate the whole universe, uh, one pixel includes all one galaxy, which is 100,000 millions of stars. So actually, I think that's insane high resolution <laughs> compared to what I've seen. Um, I actually have a question about the lecture. Um, how do you guys tell when a pulsation or a wave is at the edge or the outside? Um, how do you differentiate where a wave is if it's just based off of light? I believe that the pulsations that we detected, we see them because when we see the light, what we actually see is kind of related to how big, is, is this right, Rainer, like how big the star is at that point, right? So then when it's at the outside, it like pushes the outside out a little bit, which makes it the same when you're looking at triplets. The preferred one was the one where it's rotating at the same time. The middle was where it's going up and down. So, how can you differentiate between that and then figure out which is which? So, so what? I'm not a stellar uh, person, but from what I learned today, <laughs> is that what we're, we are the only thing we can basically tell from a star is how bright it is. So what we're measuring is the fluctuation in the brightness. And what we can do that is we can sort of decompose that into all the frequencies in which it's fluctuating this brightness. And what we're basically telling these fluctuations in brightness can have different origins. It can be either, uh, as uh, Jim showed, multiple star systems. So actually, because stars are pulling on each other, they deform in shape. Um, or they can, if they have pulsations in their, in their interior, this also changes their shape. And it's actually the, the one of the main components for your brightness, uh, if you would write down a, a, an equation for that, it would be the temperature of the star. That changes a little bit with these pulsations, but it's mainly the radius or the, the area which we're looking at. Um, that, and that thing is changing primarily. And that's how these small fluctuations are induced in 
in the in the luminosity of the star, so in the amount of light we see from a star. As for how like where it comes from, I think like well, I should ask Jim this because he's my advisor but from what I have learned from him. It's like different types of frequency of oscillations occur at different frequencies and like you the, it's these kinds of frequencies that occur at like different intervals that you actually know the interval. They're called like eigen something. But basically like some of the modes like he was talking about like L modes versus P modes and stuff like that. So some of those modes Excite, or occur at like specific frequencies and then some of the other ones occur at specific other frequencies and they don't like overlap because we can find out which frequencies and there'll be like multiples of that frequency and it occurs there. So I believe that you can figure out which one is which because you see like what frequency it occurred at and then you can also see that some of them had like similarly large amplitude or were similarly large and then those are probably the same ones occurring again. So you just based off of the pattern look at the rotation and then because of that just look for further patterns? It's a little bit, I think the part where they decide where it comes from is like complicated. Mm. Like it's not just from looking at the light curve and then we just like know this is from the going out or the up and down. I think it's like you have to do some extra math to get it back to the exact like type that it came from. So I think Jim works a lot on like how how we knew which one was which, and it was like fairly involved. But it has something to do like you can write equations that tell you like the ones that go out and in happen at these frequencies, the ones that go up and down happen at these frequencies, and you go back and look. But the frequencies are static enough to be able to pinpoint the thresholds across stars. I think they pr you, the equation might depend on the star. Like, you'd have to know something else about the star, like how dense it was or something. You know how he was, he was kind of talking about how, how dense the star is will affect uh, what happens to the oscillations. So um, I don't know if it's as general as, like, we just have this equation that works for every star. We probably have to look at different stars and know their properties and then apply that to the equation to eventually get a really good estimate of what frequencies they are. Yeah. Hopefully I'll know more in a few years. <laughs> uh, my question is kind of about the instrumentation and the technology that you use to do your studies and research and uh, like what that is more specifically now for each of you and where you think it will go in the future. Yeah, so for me, uh, currently the instruments that, uh, that I've used over the past, oh, I don't know, three, four years or so have varied from uh, 2.3 meter telescopes over out in Laramie, Wyoming, all the way up to space telescopes um, uh, in the infrared as well as um, uh, in the X-ray, for instance. Um, we have a very clear direction for where ground-based uh, observing is, go is going. Um, so we have the big telescopes coming up like the GMT. Um, and the uh, TMT, the 30 meter telescope. So these are huge, uh, 30, roughly 30 meter uh, diameter telescopes that are going to basically revolutionize our understanding of, uh, of the universe. And as far as space telescopes go, uh, are, are going, uh, NASA just had its dec uh, decadal survey where a bunch of teams put in proposals for what the next space telescope is going to be. So we have. Uh, so there are three of them that are in the optical, so near infrared, uh, optical, as well as, um, or excuse me, visible and ultraviolet. And then there's another um, uh, mission that's going to be in the X-ray. So in, in general, that's kind of like where the field is going, I guess. More on the ground, bigger telescopes, and then uh, in, the spa in space as well, bigger telescopes, but more sophisticated instruments. So for instance, the X-ray one that's been proposed, um, I know a little bit more about this one than the other ones, is a update to the premier NASA um, uh, uh, X-ray telescope called the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Uh, there's no one that's proposed, it's called the Lynx X-ray Observatory, and what it's basically gonna do is uh, increase the resolution of, um, uh, uh, of Chandra, as well as uh, the flatness of its field. So what this is basically gonna do is allow us to make much, many, many, many more discoveries, and for a fraction of the cost of a lot of the other telescopes. Um, 
And then for the ground-based observatories, uh, it's going to be the same deal. It's basically as, as you increase the diameter of your mirror, you're increasing the resolution. And that's the biggest limiting factor for any observation that you ever want to do is how small on the sky can you actually see. And with these new instruments and with these new, um, uh, with these new telescopes, we'll be able to basically decrease that number, um, how deep we'll be. Well, actually, no, two things. How deep we'll be able to see as well as, um, uh, which effectively means how much light we're going to be able to gather in one exposure, as well as with the finest resolution that we'll be able to get. So it's pretty exciting, actually. It's kind of, I feel like for the past 40 years, we've been in, like, the golden age of astronomy. It just keeps getting more golden over time. So, yeah. So, so yeah, so that's from the observational standpoint. I don't do anything with the instrument directly because <laughs> I do theory too. I'm like, at least I just like go on the computer or write equations. But a cool thing that is related is that my advisor, uh, Jim, he thinks a lot about problems that come from observations. So especially from the Zwicky transient facility. Yeah, it's like ZTF. This is something that is here. But it's cool because they observe transients which are basically things that happen briefly <laughs> in the sky that we see and they're usually weird and we don't understand them and that's really cool because we're constantly getting data from that and then my advisor is constantly going like oh I wonder why this and then he comes up with like some amazing theory for it and not just on the spot and it's really cool so that's like really fun from a learning standpoint because there's always you're always seeing new stuff come by so um uh, for me, um, so if um, you you want to study galaxies, and the, the traditional way to study galaxies is you point your telescope to a galaxy and you look one galaxy, and then what you see is the center of the galaxy because it's where the stars are, and that's very bright. So that's what you do, and then you study that galaxy. And this has been done since I don't know the 40s or the 50s, and then you can study one galaxy, and if you have time enough, then you point towards another galaxy, and you study in detail another galaxy, and so on, so on, so on. But if, um, in my case, if you want to study the evolution of galaxies in general, or statistically, and how they form, uh, then you want to not look at 10 galaxies, you want to look at a billion galaxies, and as quick as possible. So um, all my theories go in the direction of a new technique that it's um, called intensity mapping. Uh, and if you have heard of a recently approved by NASA uh, satellite called SphereX, uh, this will be a satellite that will go to space. And this satellite, the idea is like, or this telescope, um, the idea is that it will take a glance at a big patch of the sky, like if you take a panoramic picture with your phone, and it does not care very much how many bright points you have, galaxies, but some kind of statistical fluctuation, like uh, in there there are some more points bright than in here. So then you can do some statistics because you have a, uh, a lot of points. And in this way, um, so this is a new method to, to study galaxies, say large numbers of galaxies. This is something that is starting now this intensity mapping there are many projects and many experiments that will come in the next five to ten years and this will be we hope kind of a revolution in the way we study galaxies because we will have a statistically average knowledge much much more deep instead of just looking at my colleagues here one star at a time <laughs> you know Um, I'm a bit old school, so uh, I try to do very simple math that give you a general idea of something, and my work usually stops there. Then this goes to some colleagues who are computational uh, astrophysicists, uh, and then maybe they have simulations that they will like to put my equations inside and test what happens. In my case, simulations... It's impossible to stay away from them, but I try to keep it old school, pen and paper, pen and paper things. Yeah, but, but definitely there is someone expanding uh, my equations into computational to test more realistic scenarios. I do a lot of computational, but I would agree that we, know, we usually formulate what we think from the equations first because we want to make sure we understand what the computer just did, like in something that we didn't mess up the programming or something, right? So um, we would probably, we, we have been thinking about it from a pen and paper standpoint first to 
formulate the question, then we go in to make the computer set up the scenario for the question we want to answer. And then when we see what happens, we then interpret what happens from that. And it's, for me, it's more of a tool because you can get to like, you can see, well, first of all, it's like beautiful, the movies that come out of it. And you, but because it's so, it's because it's so detailed, so you can see these very specific things that can, in front of you, instead of just from the equations, um, trying to figure out more generally what can happen. Because there are some equations that we know, but we don't know the solution to them because they're like hard to solve. And the computer just like solves them for you over time. And then so you can see the results of those equations on your computer over time. And so I would say computers are the majority of my work. The computer simulations are the majority of my work. But they are still based on like some initial uh, hypotheses that we make from the equation. Yeah, I mean, we wouldn't, yeah, we do want it, we wouldn't predict it like 100%, but we want like ha to have a prediction of a general trend that we expect from it. Like we wouldn't know like every single detail that would happen, but you know, if it was supposed to get bigger and it got smaller, then we would be worried. So we can kind of say things like, oh, if this happens, it should go inward and do this versus go that way or go that way or something. And then when we see what happens if it follows what we thought it would fo do to some degree, then we're happy with it. If it's wildly different, then we reevaluate what happened there. Yeah. Can I make a quick comment too? Yeah. And it's pretty interesting the equations that actually end up get written that, that get written to try and describe these uh, systems. I mean, you kind of think about it uh, in, in terms of algebra, right? If you have two equations and two unknowns, you can solve it. With a lot of these equations, you have like one equation with like 40 plus unknowns. And mind you, most of those unknowns are coupled to one another. So like, what do you do with that? And the best thing that you can do is make very reasoned physical inferences and say, oh, well, this number here, roughly constant in these scenarios. And so like, whenever you get in said scenario, the computer will be like, okay, set that to one or whatever. And then you can say other things like, oh, well, in this other small region, we can say that these two coupled constants are actually decoupled. We can say that they are actually independent from one another and kind of again, compute all those indices. And that's why, that's how a lot of this becomes so computationally expensive is because you have all these different regimes that you have to take care of because there's no other way to, to solve them. And so it kind of gets at the whole computation time too, like how we're sort of getting past Moore's law at this point and how it's going to be necessary if you want to get better and finer resolved um, uh, simulations to try and inf to help, to basically help us uh, understand uh, some of what we're observing. It's actually kind of funny now. There, there are some uh, observations that we have that we just can't explain. So we actually go to the theorists to be like, hey, uh, I have some data, don't know what this is, can you tell me what's going on? Um, and of course, we would hope to be, for it to be the opposite, right? Like if I observe something at a telescope, I'd be like, oh, hey, theorists, by the way, I observed this, go fix your simulations. But sometimes some things are just, again, so horribly coupled in the way that we can describe them that we just have no way of, of telling what we're even looking at. So yeah. To add, there is one thing that we kind of can solve, which is actually stellar evolution. We do actually have the same number of equations as unknowns, which is cool. Um, so there are codes that like do stellar evolution, and so they do it really well. Like in that one, actually, I think the resolution is very good. It's more like 100th or 1 1,000th of the solar radius sometimes. But like that's besides the point. The, but it's still cool to use the simulations because there are all these like second order effects that we didn't take account account for and just like the equations like sometimes things go in convective ways instead of just straight out or like sometimes nonlinear things happen and like we that we couldn't have predicted just from like a sim simple solution from the I don't know four equations four unknowns maybe it's five equations five unknowns but yeah and then so I actually use that code there's a code called Mesa that does that I use it a lot to study what we something that we already understand pretty well. So like we um, already expected a lot of what it did, but then like there are some other things that happen. A lot of it is actually what Jim is talking about, like the waves that can be excited. Like we can, since we believe, since the underlying structure is already well understood, we then add on to it with these things like how the waves propagate through the star and where they go through because we trust the rest of the code to be, we already know the rest of the code is like, doing what it's supposed to do, and now we want to see what happens on top of that. So that is a nice one.
Okay, so uh, I have a question, but, but before that, so one equation, 40 unknowns, which Luis describes as simple pen and paper math. Okay, um, my, my question is for, Lu for Luis. Uh, you study galaxy formation. Um, does your study of galaxy formation encompass mergers between galaxies that have already formed, um, you know, right about how we expect the, you know, the Milky Way and M31 to emerge in a few billion years? Um, but, so my question is, do you study that? And then the, the, the second part is, are there galaxies that we have identified and determined that they are they are the product of mergers that happened in the past, and if so, how how do we determine that? Okay, the first it's one thing to say it's going to happen in the future, but how would you reconstruct the past for something like that, where you're looking at something that already you're seeing in the past? So uh, the answer to the first question is uh, sorry again, but no, um, which. Um, the first question was, uh, what was the first question? Studying galaxies merging. Merging. Galaxy formation. Yes, um, yeah, I apologize, but no, also. Actually, yeah, I, I thought that maybe I should have said that before. So my part of galaxy formation and evolution is in the cosmic history in one minute is at some point, uh, 500 million years after the Big Bang, uh, there are no galaxies, there are no stars, the whole universe is just cold gas, kind of a cold soup, very boring. And gravity just starts making clumps here and there of this gas. And then these clumps, because of compression, will heat up and this will be the first stars and the first galaxies in the history of the universe. The radiation of these objects then will start dissolving the rest of the gas and making the universe what we call transparent again. So this process is called uh, the Epoch of Cosmic Reionization, and it's when the first stars and galaxies are born. That's my uh, role in uh, galaxy formation and galaxy evolution. Then what happens from there is just the universe we see now, it's transparent, so it's not opaque because there is not much dense gas, and we have galaxies here and there. And these galaxies, over time, they grow in size and also in number, and eventually, much closer to our present day, then these galaxies start merging with each other. So uh, your question, uh, have we observed uh, merger or the product of merging galaxies? It's like, yes, um, there are many examples and some are very well detected, so are close. And, um, and how we trace that back? Uh, well, I think it's not um, completely clear yet because there are different merging scenarios. There is something called uh, dry or wet merging, depending on if you have two galaxies, and you can imagine that every galaxy is one billion of stars, and then you make one collide with the other, but actually in reality there is so much empty space that no one will touch anyone. So no star will physically collide with another star, so they just pass through. It, that's a dry merger. Uh, even though there is the gravitational field of this guy and the gravitational field of this guy, so if they are very big, what will happen is when they are close, the gravitation of one will pull the material from the other and then you will disrupt these galaxies and then you will have kind of an elongated maybe shape or something more spiral which will be the disruption of these two galaxies and, and merging together. So this is a bit of the merging theory that comes much later or much towards today in the history of galaxies, and we have uh, had many examples, or we observed many of those. But what are the what are the signatures that would allow you to look at a galaxy that's basically spiral, and and be able to say this is the product of two or more galaxies that merged in the past, as opposed to it's just a spiral galaxy like our galaxy that, as far as we know, is just formed out of a cloud and is not a merger. Right. So if you see spiral galaxy, it's not a merger, because uh, again. Today it goes about toilets, everything. So when you flush the toilet, you have kind of a spiral, and it's a very perfect spiral. So if you observe a spiraling a spiral galaxy, it's one galaxy that has evolved uh, by itself independently. Uh, if you observe something that is more elliptical, it's probably one spiral galaxy that is very old, and this, um, this spiral shape has been kind of losing energy, and then it gets kind of elongated. But again, it's not merged. What you would identify as a merger is, for instance, a galaxy with an irregular shape. You say, this has a weird shape. I don't know, L shape. 
if it has an L shape, it's like, hmm, that's weird. And then what you can measure is the velocity or the direction of movement of big chunks of gas or stars in there. And usually you can identify two big directions or two big trends of movement, and then it's how you identify mergers, for instance. Yeah. Thanks. There's also another way that you can tell, and this is um, looking at the metallicities of each of the stars that are in a galaxy. So, for instance, with the Milky Way, uh, the oldest stars that we know of are in the are in the halo. So these are stars that have metallicities that are a fraction of um, the of the sun's metallicity. Now, you would expect, then, given our current galaxy uh, 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 evolution theories, that all the stars that are along the arms of the galaxies would have higher metallicities because they would have formed later. You can imagine that the halo starts, and then after a while, the... Uh, the, the halo is the center, the bulge at the center? Yes, exactly. And so and then you would imagine that the stars outer would, uh, um, would start to form later on. So they would be more metal-rich. So if you see this gradient of, like, the more metal-rich stars are, are uh, in the disk, as you, and then uh, they would decrease as you start to go to the center, then that would also be another indicator that, yes, this galaxy has not, uh, uh, has not merged. And you can imagine... Therefore, if we, were to, if we were to go forward, that if you see that there is no metallicity gradient at all, that everything just seems kind of mixed up, like, oh, there's a you know, star fraction solar, and then there's one that's supersolar, for instance, then perhaps that also is another indicator for, uh, for a merger. This, this technique is actually called galactic archaeology. One of the professors here, Evan Kirby, who, I, who I'm actually working with, uh, uh, th this is his field of research, so that's why I wanted to also mention that. There, there are more quantitative ways to also figure out uh, um, whether or not a galaxy has... Uh, merged with another one before. It also doesn't have to be a major uh, uh, merger either. It could be a merger between a big galaxy like the Milky Way as well as a dwarf galaxy like Reticulum 2 or something, or Ursa Major 1 or something like that, which wouldn't necessarily disrupt the entire uh, Milky Way, but it would leave signatures and traces once again, like streams, for instance, which we do observe, stuff like that. Uh, this question is for each of you. I'd, I'd like each of you to answer, including Rainier, right? Yeah. Um, just tell me at least one non-astronomy hobby that, that you guys do. Oh, also, uh, Evan, uh, I was a teacher in the South Bay area, and I would love for my students to become your students. So I really hope that it does go first full circle and that you do teach at ECC someday. Anyway, yeah, so go for it. Yeah, what, what are some of your hobbies? I am in Caltech Orchestra. I play violin, which is pretty fun. I also run a lot, and I, I do origami. I guess that's my other thing. <laughs> Um, let's see. So I'm a console gamer, so I like to play PS4. Uh, I'm currently playing, um, I think I just finished Call of Duty uh, yesterday. And I'm actually playing through the Bioshock series. I haven't played those before. I played The Last of Us this summer. Great game. Ah, brought a tear to my eye. Yes. Uh, I can't wait for uh, uh, Last of Us Part 2 to come out. Oh, it's going to be so good. Just, just for reference, by the way, this game, like the cutscenes are so good that when my mom saw me playing it, she was like, oh, what movie are you watching? I was like, oh, wow, this is actually a video game. And I like, talked to her for like half an hour. It's great. Um, I also love music, so I love music discovery. So I'm kind of all over the place. Like this morning, I was listening to like 40 swing music, for instance. And then I'll, I, I was walking over here listening to a brand new album by Earl Sweatshirt, who's a rapper that just um, uh, released an album yesterday. Um, I'm also trying to start making my own music. Um, I have so many, I can't actually play an instrument, but I have so many melodies in my head given all the different music styles that I listen to, that I just need some way to actually get it out into the medium. Our goal is to teach you how to play piano. Yes, I want to learn how to play piano. Uh, one of my <laughs> favorite uh, genres is actually a jazz piano, so that's, uh, that's also fun. And um, I'm also training for a half marathon, actually, with Sam. I mean, she's not going to run the half marathon with me, but uh, I'm also training for a half marathon. I suffer with him for fun, I guess. It's the best, <laughs> literally the best. Um, and... I think the final thing that I would want to mention is I'm an, I'm an amateur astronomer, so I like to go out and observe with my own telescope. So again, just it's nice to go from the theory and all the beautiful research to again actually seeing them with the naked eye. It just to me nothing beats it. Um, I I presume that if you ask my girlfriend there, uh, she will tell you that uh, my hobbies work. 
uh, which which I don't agree, but uh, that might happen. Um, but other than that, uh, I do a lot of sports. I play basketball and I run and I swim and um, something else uh, I don't remember now. When there is a snow, which is not the case here, I like skiing as well. Um, yeah, those are a bit my hobbies. Uh, but I think we are very lucky because the job we have it's somewhat uh, also a hobby. Being an astronomer, I think it's a, a very cool job that shares part of uh, being a real job, but also it's something that you can have a, as a hobby a little bit. So I, I just started doing this job like um, six years ago, being an astronomer six years ago or something, and I'm now 39 years old, so before that I've, doing, I've been doing many other different jobs um, so I think this one is kind of a hobby. Yeah, so for me, I play a lot of board games. Uh, so I really enjoyed that. And I used to do field hockey back in my home country. Uh, that sport is not played here in the US or anywhere else in the world. Um, so I more or less replaced that by hiking a lot in the mountains, which again, I don't have in my home country. So I enjoy that a lot. <laughs> um, uh, other than that, I think I can uh, support what Louis has said, saying uh, basically every astronomer considers what he's doing a hobby. Uh, and I think that also was reflected in the answer, What? where do you see your future? I have hardly ever heard an astronomer say, my next job is going into industry. Because if that was their goal, they would have not picked to go into astronomy. They would have, they would have, picked, some, they would have picked something else. In the end... We see a lot of people going out. If they are going out of astronomy, they are going into industry. But that, yeah, it happens because of there's a simple pyramid. So there's a lot of undergraduates, then there's some graduate positions for graduate students, and then the positions become less and less. So people have to flow out. And I know, for example, in the Netherlands, there is now an active program for astronomy graduate students to get them into in to to promote them going into industry because otherwise the pyramid doesn't work again because all the graduate students who choose to go into astronomy they like it so much it is their hobby and they want to stay there so you have to kick them to really get them away what are some of the board games i played um the the, the 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 answer is more or less all of them. Uh, we have, since we moved here in the U.S. early January, so that's close to a year ago, me and my wife have played close to 100 new board games that we had never played before. Board yeah, anything from... Wow. Haven't heard of that one, but really? willing to try. Yeah. <laughs> So in today's lecture, uh, we heard about uh, pulsating um, stars. I also heard, uh, you know, in another uh, lecture in, uh, on astronomy and tap, that black holes also have a way of pulsating. Now, in that case, it's not light, but it's a gravitational wave. I mean, uh, the uh, metaphor was like ringing a bell. Now, can you explain how these two, whether they're related or whether they're similarities, and how do they? How does the black, sorry, the black hole thing work? That's a tough one, um, but it's a, a very important one nowadays, and it's a um, hot topic question. So um, the gravitational waves from from the black holes, the gravitational waves that have been in the news recently, that now actually they they are being detected regularly, and a lot of them, I, these gravitational waves happen when two black holes kind of approach each other. So if you remember the binary system that Jim uh, played the movie, um, there were two, two stars orbiting around each other. So uh, this is exactly when the, how the gravitational waves are uh, emitted by two um, orbiting uh, black holes or colliding black holes. It can be black holes or actually neutron stars as well. So you need two very compact and very massive objects. And being very compact and very massive, what they do is they distort space and time. 
So instead of having space flat, they just make a distortion in space. So what happens is when they, um, that is uh, exactly this distortion is around the black hole uh, for every black hole. But when the two black holes find each other and they start orbiting around each other, um, these two distortions interact like waves and they can interfere and, and cancel them or they can interfere and double their power. So basically what happens is while these two black holes are orbiting around, the frequency of every orbit, so how much time it takes to orbit one uh, with the other, is the frequency of the wave that they will emit. So two black holes that are very distant and orbit like this, they will emit a very, how is that, high or low pitch? I, I, I don't know this um, thing, but uh, the wave will be very long and not very strong. But then when the two black holes are very close, they spin very fast around each other, and then this gravitational wave is very intense, and it's how uh, we detect this. Uh, so it's similar to a binary system of stars, but instead of the stars pulsating, it's not the black holes that pulsate, it's just the space around the black hole gets stretched and compressed, so distorted. I to add that the other difference is that with stars, you don't have to be in a binary to have the pulsation. So there was like definitely the ones that Jim showed, the cool heartbeat star, that one was like a binary and triple, but you can have single stars pulsate too because they actually, inside the star, because of how the structure of the star is, like there are different zones of, and the zones are different ways that energy is transported in the star, and at the boundaries of those zones, you can actually find that waves are excited at the boundary, just from the star being by itself, just what's happening inside, and those waves start in the cores of stars, and then they propagate out in the star all over in that, like that first movie he showed where everything was just going in that cool spirographic pattern. So those kinds of waves can be excited in the star on its own without like an exterior force or something. Yeah. Okay. It is nine o'clock, so that actually means we're at the end of our Q&A panel. I'd like our pa to thank our panelists one more time. Thank you all for being here and hope to see you again uh, at November 11th, 18th or December 6th.